Okay, I guess most of us are here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are just about to start with e the ETH SUSI 2023 Karaban Marash Earthquake Reconnaissance Webinar. I am Professor Božidar Stojadinović from ETH Zurich, and I will give you a very short introduction. So while I guess everybody is assembling, uh, we'll do this, and uh, towards the end, you'll see the agenda, and hopefully by then we'll have quite a few more people joined in. So the the uh, uh, next slide, which I will hopefully be able to get to soon, is going to introduce the mission that we organized uh, right after the very tragic and very large set of earthquakes that hit this southeastern region of Turkey and Syria also uh, in, in the early February 2020, uh, 2023. The events were very moving and not only uh, is, it, is it difficult to see that, but it's also difficult to understand that from the civil engineering standpoint and see how we could possibly do this better and how people still, still suffer and, and uh, uh, deal, have to deal with the consequences of such large earthquakes, not only in the immediate aftermath, but even now as we speak. So we organized a mission that was there in the middle of March, from March 16 to March 21, and it was a small group of people from Switzerland. That was uh, Shafa Karsan Turkoglu, Dr. Nikola Blagojevic, and Professor Mikalis Vasiliu. Uh, the other part of the team came from uh, Serbia from the Serbian Association for Earthquake Engineering, the University of Belgrade uh, with Professor Marko Marinković and University of Ljubljana with Nemanja Kartinić. And then we had excellent, most excellent help from Turkey, from the people out there who knew what was going on, Dr. Sharifi Ozata from uh, Kirsheri Ahi Ervan University and Dr. Zeynep Ünsal Asian uh, from Tokaj, Tokaj Gazi Mopansa, sorry, university, they were, they joined the team uh, and, and were very, very helpful in leading and, and hopefully uh, uh, helping us learn something more than us just walking around. Uh, uh, at the very last moment, Professor Christoph Buttenweg from uh, RWTH Aachen from the Technical Hochschule uh, in Aachen joined the team also to, to see how things are going to go. Uh, we visited 16 cities and nearby villages and the infrastructure in between, and uh, we were guided by the damage reports that were already streaming in. This was already about six weeks after the earthquake. Before we go on to the seminar itself, let me thank a couple of uh, people and organizations. First, it is uh, the locals who helped us a lot. Uh, the um, AFAD uh, organization, the Turkish Federal Emergency Management Agency equivalent was very instrumental in allowing us access uh, to the facilities and especially so uh, Dr. Recep Sakir, uh, Professor Orhan Tatar and uh, Felix Tuba Kadiroglu. Uh, and for to them we owe special thanks. And then in the background, people who were not there with us but helped us tremendously organize the mission, focus the mission, get some additional help from Professor Svetlana Brzev uh, from uh, SUSI, uh, Professor Ayhan Ifanoglu, Professor Polat Gulkan, Professor Alpet Ilki, Professor Murat uh, uh, er Erbenik, Professor Kurtlus uh, Atsaver and, and uh, Gozde Osgun. Um, and they also helped us together with the, the locals, Nürsen, uh, Buyuk, Kasik and Fuad, Buyukasik and Murat Akpinar, who helped locally uh, the team survive and see as much as they did, as much as you will see in these presentations. Financially, it was the ETH who helped. It was the SUSI, the organization, the, uh, the, the Serbian Association for Earthquake Engineering and the University of Ljubljana, who supported parts of uh, in people of, of, the, of this mission. Uh, to a largest extent. And finally, of course, it was the uh, Turkish University who, who uh, let Sharife and Ozata take a few days off to spend them with us. Uh, with that said, and a very deep thanks to everybody uh, who helped, let me go on and take a look at the agenda. As you will see, I will very shortly finish the introduction and pass the control on to uh, Dr. Olenciu Danciu, 
uh, who will talk about the seismological aspects and further, as you will see, Sherif and Shafak and then Ebanya will uh, talk about some of the observations and about damage. We'll have a short break about 18.05 uh, and then continue with uh, quite a bit more on masonry structure, industrial facilities and the recovery, which will uh, come towards the end. Uh, about seven o'clock, a little bit before seven o'clock this evening uh, in Zurich, we'll have the question and answer session and the closing remarks uh, at the very, very end. That said, I hope that uh, I see that quite a lot more people joined in. There are 72 of us online. Thank you, everybody who is attending. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think you hear. I am Shirley Kuzov. I am an architect. And I am a current researcher and teaching assistant in, at Ahirvan University. Today, uh, I will speak, uh, I will try to share my experience about first post earthquake damage assessment. I have been on the site for two times for different missions, and hopefully, the third one will be next week. And the content of this presentation is uh, firstly, start with the damage assessment. What is damage assessment? And then I will define the building damage categories and the damage categories for RC members. Then I will try to explain the damage assessment algorithm. And I will give details about the exterior and interior assessment. And I will conclude the presentation. So, what is post urban damage assessment? It is the process of observational evaluating and classifying the damage. Uh, caused by O3, and but it doesn't consider the potential damage that a larger earthquake in the region could cause, or it is not a determination of whether the building is earthquake resistant or not. So the assessment methodology, methodology must be rapidly applicable and straightforward because there are a huge number of buildings that require inspections. Also, uh, so there is a shortage of qualified inspectors. So to solve this problem, the damage assessment methodology has been developed, that we used in, on the site, developed by Professor Dr. Arthur Yuki and his team since the beginning of, beginning of this millennia. And it has been used in many of weeks to evaluate the damages in RC and measurement structures. Today, I will just mention about the uh, damage assessment in RC structures. And they made some several adjustments, improvements to enhance its applicability. And at the end, it's accepted by Minister of Environment, Urbanization, and Climate Change as a general damage assessment. If you want to delve into the details of this uh, methodology, you can check the paper. And first, I will tell a little bit about damage categories. I will give details later. And then I said that some damage building, as you said, there isn't earthquake damage and slight damage building has minor damages on uh, on its uh, structural elements both horizontal and vertical elements and if a building is moderately damaged it has certain decrease in its performance and capacity it has some kinds of spread uh, type i will define later and uh, here, the damage building has significant loss of pre earthquake performance. And if a building partially collapses or it has residual displacement, the building uh, must be demolished uh, immediately. And the collapsed building, as you see, uh, from the floor uh, partially collapsed one. And for damage categories, uh, RC, uh, RC members, uh, there is the tier type zero. Sometimes people mix it with the creep uh, damages or corrosion damages. Uh, the damage must be because of the earthquake in the uh, induced uh, effect. So just we have to be sure about it is because of the earthquake. And for type E, you see on the picture, uh, the residual crack width must be, be small or equal to 0 0.5 millimeters, and we will not observe any compression damage on the horizontal uh, elements. And for the type B, we will observe a uh, quick width between 0 0.5 and 3 millimeters, and sometimes uh, we will see cover crashing. And for type C, 
uh, will, there will be a power spelling and the correct may, may be either the correct will be bigger than three millimeters and for the type D you can see buckling of reinforcement and core crushing and sometimes residual display, display, displacement can be observed and for damage assessment algorithm this uh, consists of two stage procedure uh, the exterior assessment for the exterior assessment you have to check the all, all around the building and facade and when you detect a uh, damage on an, on an element, you have to be sure about that is it structural or non-structural. If you are sure that they are non-structural uh, non and it is not risky to enter the inner part, then you will continue to interior assessment. And why, when you see a crack uh, on the blaster, sometimes we have to crash it to be sure about that is it structural or non-structural. So for exterior assessment, first of all, we ask the, the, this question step by step. Is there a total collapse? If your answer is yes, so it's collapse building. If your answer is no, then again, as is there partial collapse? If your answer is yes, so this building must be demolished immediately. So, and if your answer is no, then continue the third question. Is there any permanent res horizontal residual displacement visited at any store in the building is greater than one person of the corresponding floor height? So if your answer uh, is yes and the residual displacement bigger than one person, it's still a damaged building. But if it is bigger than three person, this building must be promptly damaged. And for the fourth question, does the structure experience a rigid rotation exceeding two degree? If your answer is yes, so it's still a damaged building. But if the rotation angle is bigger than four degree, this building also must be urgent dam damaged. If your answer to all these questions uh, are no, then we can pass to interior assessment. Uh, this assessment has three levels. Uh, these are rapid detailed, and I will just mention about assessment in crisis situations. And this uh, assessment is applicable for low and mid rise building, uh, which have plan area smaller than 800 meters square. And we will initiate the assessment from the most damaged floor, and this is generally the ground floor, as you know. For interior assessment, the first question is, is the number of columns I shared the type damage type for so our members to remember. Is the number of columns or shared walls that have type D damage equal to or bigger than one? If your answer is yes, so this building is directly given the damage building. If your answer is no, then are there any types of damaged columns or shared walls and how many of if they are more or equal to uh, two, it's heavily damaged. If your answer is no, then continue to third question. Is the number of damaged elements, structural elements I mean, of type B, smaller than three? If your answer is yes, it's slightly damaged building. If your answer is no, it's mother to damaged building, but you will not observe that you are in, in this place. Are there, are all, if you have a building that has only type E damage, regardless of the number, so it's slightly damaged building. And if there isn't any earthquake in this damage, it's undamaged building. And you see the pepper damage assessment sheet that we use at the very beginning of the uh, post earthquake assessment. And then uh, I translated it in, into English with some of the, the stages that I mentioned before. And this is the online version, uh, this application version. And we, in one month after the earthquake, uh, it is possible to uh, assess, assess, it's possible to assess 1.7 million buildings with this uh, damage assessment methodology. So it's totally implementable, easy to follow and understand. And thank you. Uh, I finished and I would like to thank the ETH and Suzy for giving me this opportunity. Do you have any questions? Here is my email. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sedefe. This was a very nice presentation. Let us switch on to the okay. next one. We are, as you can see, moving fairly quickly. Uh, there is quite a lot of ground to cover. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Shafak Arslan Turkoğlu. I'm a PhD candidate at ETH uh, Zurich at the Chair of Structural Dynamics and Earthquake Engineering led by uh, Professor Stoyadinovic. I will talk about the, uh, I mean, I will try to give a short introduction into the history of Turkish uh, building codes, and I will try to mention the, uh, the most recent 2018 merge, uh, version. Um, I apologize, I have been uh, recovering from a cold in the last, uh, in the last, in the past few days. My wife's voice is still not fully back to normal. Uh, that's why I decided to make this part a bit uh, shorter so I can uh, conserve my voice for the for the second part, which is about the uh, masonry structures. So let me start. <clears throat> the development of uh, Turkish codes, they have been closely linked to the history of major earthquakes in the country. And Turkey has experienced over 40 earthquakes with a magnitude uh, larger than 6.5 in the last 100 years. And many of them, as already mentioned, uh, occurring along the North Anatolian and, uh, and the East uh, Anatolian fault lines. And major earthquakes uh, are not uncommon in Turkey with a destructive earthquake occurring approximately every uh, three years. Their uh, initial treatment began in uh, 1940, just one year after the Erzincan earthquake. That, uh, this code back then was a translation of the Italian uh, seismic codes. And over the course of the following years, there were further refinements in the seismic <clears throat> zone definition to better capture the seismic characteristic uh, given the uh, different regions. Until 1968, the regulations primarily focused on timber and masonry buildings, and they included uh, provisions for their structural detailing mostly. In 1968, significant changes were implemented, particularly in the dimensioning of concrete members and their structural detailing. In 1998, the uh, code introduced the elastic design spectrum, implemented the capacity-based uh, design regulations, and 2007, is the year marking the first regulations uh, regarding the assessment and retrofit of existing buildings. And today's standard is the 28, uh, 2018, including the seismic design regulations and also for the assessment of and retrofit of existing ones. And here is a, when we turn our, our attention uh, to, the, uh, to the structure of the 2018 code, these are the chapters compared to its uh, it's uh, the previous version from 2007, uh, which only had seven chapters. This code is extended to address uh, diverse uh, different uh, topics. Two designer principles are treated in uh, these chapters. The chapter four focusing on conventional force-based capacity design regulations, aiming to ensure uh, life safety performance objectives using uh, linear analysis methods, or here, the chapter five, nonlinear analysis procedures uh, based uh, on uh, performance-based earthquake engineering. And here are the further chapters uh, dealing with the material-specific uh, recommendations. And what sets the 2018 code uh, apart is the addition of some special chapters, such as the chapter 13 for high-rise buildings or the 14th chapter dedicated to the base isolated uh, buildings. These were implemented in this code for the first time. And these topics that were newly introduced, they require uh, obviously specific considerations and to address them, uh, a new clause was added to the code, emphasizing the importance of professional expertise throughout the design and construction uh, process. Its uh, mandate it prescribes that uh, construction supervision uh, to be carried out by professional uh, experts in all relevant phases, starting from the preliminary design up until the completion of the uh, project. And some of these special topics, they include site-specific uh, hazard analysis, nonlinear dynamic analysis, or also base isolation or topics like soil structure interaction, et cetera. Excuse me. 
So one of the significant uh, improvements in the new uh, code, seismic code, that relates the, to the definition of seismic hazard characteristics before 2018, the country was divided into, uh, into seismic zones, each assigned with an anchoring peak ground uh, uh, acceleration uh, value. Uh, however, the changes in the new code, it introduced a new uh, seismic uh, hazard uh, model that model allows a more refined and precise assessment of seismic hazards based on the exact definition of uh, locations. So one can use this web tool provided by AFAT using the exact address or the GPS locations to define uh, different hazard characteristics, for example, PGA or different spectral acceleration levels. And for, the, for any site of interest in Turkey, these uh, spectral acceleration coefficients to start with, they can be extracted from this AFAT web tool. These are uh, two SS and S1. And these are both uh, unitless metrics. SS represents the short period spectral acceleration and S1 referring to a period of uh, one second. And then these are to multiply with the soil coefficients or soil-based parameters FS and F, uh, F1. Another update refers to the corner periods of the response spectrum. In the majority of the building codes, the corner periods are directly defined based on the, based on the characteristics of uh, soil classes. However, in the Turkish code, <clears throat> the, a different approach is uh, take, uh, taken by defining these corner periods based on the spectral accelerations, ST1 and STS. The second corner period is the ratio of this uh, one second to the short period acceleration. When this value is defined, 20% of this uh, corner period uh, TB is defined as the first corner period. The code has several key uh, safety objectives uh, for uh, ensuring the public safety by minimizing the collapse uh, risk. That is the, 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 the goal we aim for. Before we focus on these uh, performance targets, we can look at some of the parameters associated with uh, these objectives. And depending on its function, the buildings are classified to a building use class, here abbreviated as BKS. For each class, the corresponding importance factor is uh, defined based on the importance or um, based on the class of the buildings. For residential buildings, for example, we set a BKS of uh, three, set referring to an importance factor of 1.0. Here in the next table, <clears throat> seismic design categories defined as DTS are uh, defined based on the based on the 475 uh, return period earthquake. These are not seismic zones in a, con in a conventional manner, but rather design classes so that the code can differentiate between uh, different methodologies for the design and the assessment. Uh, techniques. And based on the seismic design categories, each building can then be assigned to a building height class, BYS. And depending on the site class, the performance targets are defined by the, by the tw uh, 2018 code regulations. And the behavior and the overstrength factors are uh, given, are extensively defined for various building typologies. On the right hand side here, you see an extract for uh, masonry buildings as an example for unreinforced masonry. This BYS, the height category, is classified as eight, meaning that the maximum building height cannot exceed 10.5 meters in regions with moderate uh, seismicity or in, uh, in higher seismicity uh, regions, the building height is limited even uh, further to seven meters. <clears throat> The performance targets for the design and also for the assessment are defined based on the uh, damage states. These are the four damage states, the continued operation, limited or controlled damage, and collapse uh, prevention. In total, we have four performance uh, targets, targets. For buildings that are not classified as tall or high-rise buildings, we use uh, this table. The ordinary uh, performance target is set to control damage under the design level of earthquake. To reach uh, this performance target, the code allows the implement or allows, allows the uh, employment of force-based approaches. 
critical buildings with a vital importance. These are mentioned here, uh, such as hospitals or high potential consequences in case of failure. They have uh, advanced performance targets, meaning that for them there are different uh, or other hazard levels other than the uh, other than the uh, 500 year return period earthquakes. Okay, to uh, perhaps to uh, conclude, to sum up the, the code 2018, uh, it expands upon its predecessor from 2017. Uh, further, uh, further consideration, it covers a broader range, range of uh, topics. It introduces, for example, a refined definition of seismic hazard, incorpor incorporates the use of exact uh, geographical coordinates for a more accurate and site-specific assessment. It also addresses important aspects such as base isolation or high-rise buildings reflecting the evolving nature of seismic design practices. So this brings me to the end of my presentation and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Shafak, very much. And as you already know, there will be a short break before we switch over to the next presentation, just a few seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nemanja Kartinic, and I'm a young researcher and PhD student from Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering, University of Ljubljana, as also member of Learning from Earthquakes Committee of Serbian Association for Earthquake Engineering. Uh, in the following, Professor Marko Marinkovic and I will present the team's observation regarding the performance of RC structures during our visit uh, to the areas uh, affected by devastating earthquakes. So most of the buildings that collapsed or partially collapsed were reinforced concrete RC structures. And uh, it's very important observation that the RC frame structures with masonry fill and RC frames with shear walls and masonry fills suffered most structural damage. Uh, you can see here uh, two opposite sides, uh, one, uh, one building, that was uh, suffered uh, total collapse. And on the other side, uh, most famous, uh, uh, mo most famous uh, chamber of engineers in Karaman Marash, uh, which was practically undamaged during uh, these earthquakes. Uh, this table shows the percentage of households uh, grouped by construction period for 11 provinces in the earthquake affected region compared to the Turkey as a whole, it should be noted that the, uh, that the percentage of households uh, that were built since 2001 is around 50% in the region affected by the earthquakes. And in the last 20 years, more than half of the building stock in this region are new buildings. Also, it can be seen from this diagram uh, that the load bearing system of buildings in almost 87% uh, in a, of buildings is made of reinforced concrete. Uh, during the field, during the field uh, visit, different types of lateral load resisting systems in the earthquake affected region were observed. Uh, for example, uh, many buildings of RC frame systems, dual systems, RC shear wall system buildings, uh, an entire complex of tunnel form buildings and flat slab system buildings. Observed damage types of RC structures uh, are listed below, and in the following uh, in the following slides, we will talk about uh, some typical uh, damage types of RC structures. Uh, here is a RC building uh, RC building uh, with shear walls located in Tukolu. Uh, this building has RC monolithic slab and uh, shear walls. Uh, running from bottom to the top of the building. Constructed uh, construction of this residential building started five years ago. Uh, it was observed uh, that the shear walls 
Nether shear walls on the ground floor suffered significant structural damage, as you can see here. And uh, uh, river buckling was most commonly uh, was the most commonly uh, observed damage in structural elements. The spacing of the stirrup was 10 centimeters, as you can see here. Uh, but they opened because the stirrups uh, bent with uh, 90 degree uh, hooks. Uh, rupture uh, of the uh, longitudinal river were also observed in this building. Uh, in addition, uh, the poor disposition of the building probably uh, led to these structural damages. Uh, of course, uh, for infill walls uh, made from concrete, uh, made from concrete blocks, uh, they suffered heavy damage and auto plane collapse. Uh, also, in the lower part of this uh, slide, uh, was given uh, PGA and PGV values of the closest uh, seismic station. Uh, another uh, example is also RC Vault building located in Tokolo. This building uh, was built in uh, 2019. Shear walls in the ground floor uh, in, are located in the ground floor, but not continuous to the top of the building. From the right part of the slide, uh, you can see the appearance of the buildings before and after the, 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 these earthquakes. And as you can see from the right side, uh, the building uh, was totally uh, totally collapsed, doc, uh, but another building, left building, was uh, di did not collapse, but uh, suffered significant structural damages. Uh, the structural damages was uh, given here. Uh, this is buckling of, of uh, reinforced concrete uh, uh, reinforced concrete columns uh, at the basement of this building, but uh, uh, the uh, st uh, spacing of stirrups was 10 centimeters, uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, stirrups they opened because they bent uh, with an, uh, 90 degree hooks. Uh, so, uh, not so far. From this building, uh, we come to the next RC building, with shear walls. This building uh, consists uh, from ground floor and two floors, and the use of smooth river uh, was uh, were observed uh, both of longitudinal and transverse uh, rivers. Also, uh, the spacing of stirrups was uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, the diameter of stirrups is six millimeters and then uh, across the street there are another RC uh, building with shear walls and with frames. Uh, as you can see from the right part of the slide, uh, infill walls made from uh, hollow clay, uh, hollow clay uh, masonry blocks, uh, which uh, which was placed. Uh, both vertically and horizontally, and the infill walls totally collapsed at the lower part, at lower stories. Uh, these shear walls, uh, the thickness of the shear walls is 30 centimeters, and uh, as already Sheriff told us, uh, the indicator uh, shows the white cracks of these shear walls is about one millimeter. Another building is typical RC frame building under construction co under construction in Urda. At that moment, this building has uh, a ground floor and four floors. Uh, and also, uh, as, as in previous examples of buildings in Turkolu, uh, it was observed uh, it was observed as some structural damage of the vertical elements in the critical zone of these elements. The spacing of stirrups was 20 centimeters, uh, which causes a buckling of longitudinal reinforcement. Then, uh, inadequate lap splices, length of longitudinal reinforcement were uh, identified. And then, uh, at the lower part of the concrete uh, of the RC uh, columns, uh, were observed uh, the segregation of concrete. 
And now uh, an extremely interesting example of a 35 year old school building located across the street uh, from a building under construction that has suffered several structural damage, as you can see from the previous slide. And, and as you can see here from these photos, uh, the school building suffered uh, light damage uh, during these earthquakes. Uh, another interesting example is associated with the several identical buildings, RC frame buildings in Bakhche built in 2020 that suffered light structural damage uh, uh, at the critical zone of the vertical elements of the RC columns. Uh, these buildings consist of a uh, ground floor and five floors, and the dimensions of the ground floor is 30 by 10 meters. Uh, there are two types of columns, square 50 by 50 and rectangular 30 by 80 centimeters. The ground floor is open for parking, as you can see from the left, left photo from Google, Google Maps. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are a very limited number of uh, infill walls on this, on this uh, ground, ground floor level. The height of the ground floor is 2.4 meters. Also, regarding the damage of infill walls on these uh, RC residential buildings in Bakhche, uh, it, was, it was observed a, a very significant damage of uh, infill walls at the ground floor level, and the whole pieces uh, fell, fell, um, fell out. Mm -hmm. uh, also, at the higher stories, uh, it was it was observed uh, a significant damage of facet facet walls. Okay, on the way to Karaman Maras, the soft story mechanism uh, were observed on a two-story RC frame family house. Uh, this mechanism arose from the from the very poor seismic uh, detailing of reinforcement. As you can see here, uh, the absence of transverse reinforcement and lack of confinement at the end zone of the columns of the exterior, one of the exterior type, uh, one of the exterior RC columns, and also uh, because of poor connection uh, of reinforcement uh, between uh, column and, uh, and, and beam at the joint of column beam. Another Example is a, a mid-rise RC frame building with shear walls uh, located in Karaman Marash near to Chamber of Engineers. Uh, this residential building uh, was built around 2000 and uh, also this building uh, suffered several structural damage uh, in, 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 the, in the lower part of the shear walls at the ground floor level. In terms of uh, in terms of buckling of reinforcement, also uh, the spacing of reinforcement was 15 centimeters, and also for uh, for for uh, because of um, uh, a lack of uh, transverse reinforcement, uh, it can it can be seen from from this part of of the photo. Yes, is the uh, many of longitudinal rivers did not. Uh, are not anchored in the foundation as one of the observation on in this building. Uh, as one of the most uh, most destroyed part of Karaman Marash is also uh, is certainly uh, Main Street in the main in Trabzon uh, Boulevard, and uh, you can see uh, how it how it looked uh, before the earthquake left side of the street and then how it looked after the earthquake. Also on the left side of the street, all the buildings were heavy damaged or totally collapsed. Not so far from the main street, uh, it was a RC building with shear walls. Uh, it, this building, this residential building was built in 2008. This building has RC monolithic slabs and uh, two identical buildings next to each other at one 
collapsed as you can see as you can see here dimensions of the ground floor uh, ground floor is 20 by 18 meters and uh, we have two walls two shear walls with uh, two shear walls of 2.5 meters and one shear walls uh, of four meters in the longer direction also uh, the also uh, as you can see here the structural significant structural damage of the building which did not collapse is uh, observed and uh, in terms of development of hinge uh, development of hinge at the joint uh, beam shear wall and then uh, also rupture of buckling and uh, rupture of reinforcement and buckling of reinforcement also as already uh, sharife told us about tilting of buildings. This building has a uh, two uh, degree of inclination. Okay, uh, we we come to, uh, to to an excellent example of flat slab building located in Elbistan. Uh, this residential building has ground floor uh, with, and uh, three floors. Uh, this building were damaged and collapsed in the uh, in the 7.5 earthquake, and uh, because of a poor connection of columns uh, between the columns and uh, RC slabs, uh, uh, this weak connection led to the pancake failure of this building. And finally, uh, as one of the extreme cases of uh, seismic soil liquefaction induced tilting and overturning of uh, RC residential buildings in the main street in Gulbashi. And from the uh, left part of the slide, uh, you, uh, you can see the appearance of buildings before and after the earthquake. Uh, and uh, also differential settlements goes five to 10 degrees tilting of buildings in the main street also in Gulbashi. And you can see here, uh, in particular, this building has seven uh, degrees of inclination and another one uh, has five, uh, five degrees of uh, in inclination. Uh, as uh, our colleagues from Turkey told us, it's, uh, it's uh, unrepairable and uh, these buildings has to be, uh, had to be uh, demolished. And that's it from my side, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Nemanja, uh, and this is a point when uh, we, we reach the, the, the time to take a very short break. Thank you to all the speakers. We are actually a little bit ahead of time. We went quite fast. Uh, since we have a, a, a minute, it, I don't, I, we didn't really open any chats uh, for the audience, but perhaps somebody could type in a question. But among the speakers, do you have any, any questions, any clarifications that you would like to make? Sorry, Professor, I have one clarification. We're going to have a second part of the RC structure presentation now by Marko Marinkovic, and then we'll move oh, to the break. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Sorry, sorry, Why did, I didn't realize. Well, Marko, can you. you just take over the, the, the screen? I just gave you control. So. Yes, oh, yeah, I have the control. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry about this, then let's go, Marko. Um, so there is a lot of uh, material and uh, we have to split it in uh, two parts, but I also have to mention that uh, uh, due to the time limitation, we had to select just a couple of interesting examples to show you. Otherwise, the presentation would last, I don't know, two days. And I hope in uh, our next uh, webinars or publications, the uh, ETH and SUSI will have a chance to show our findings to the to you and the other uh, interest uh, sites. So my name is Mark Marinkovic. I'm assistant professor at the Faculty of Civil Engineering at the University of Belgrade. And then when you told you, uh, as I said, just some aspects of the uh, first two days of our visit, and I will continue with the third day, when we continued uh, to, let's say, southwest part of uh, Turkey. And on the way in front of Nurda, we visited Sunflower Oil uh, Refinery Plant. And it's a huge complex that I think uh, Christoph uh, will tell you more details about the damage uh, in this uh, factory. But for us, it was interesting, this short column effect that we uh, noticed 
And uh, it was, of course, due to the interaction of the reinforced concrete frame and partial height uh, infill walls. So definitely the, the added shear force that this infill wall is uh, adding uh, to the concrete uh, column was too much for the uh, column to survive, although the dimensions were quite, let's say, satisfactorily 70 by uh, 50 uh, centimeters. And what was interesting for us, we rarely saw the hooks uh, of stirrups in 135 degrees. Here they were, but although even uh, that was present, the, the, rebar, the stirrups opened because, yeah, the short column had too much force into it. And uh, from my point of view, maybe also the inner stirrups were missing in this kind of column. However, we know that the short column effect is quite strong to the columns. Uh, then we went to Ischendorf, uh, quite interesting example we showed here, although we saw other parts. Uh, here uh, is the area where most of the buildings were four stories, so ground floor plus three stories. And they told us it's because there is some rule that if you have more than four stories, you need to install the elevator in the building. And they were, let's say, escaping from this in order to yeah, make it cheaper not to have the elevator and also to keep some area for the apartments instead of uh, elevator taking in. But um, in this area, it was really devastating. The whole complex of buildings was uh, completely collapsed. So total uh, collapse of the structures. And then some examples. So these are the buildings of uh, built in 1965, 75, and so on. And you can see the photos from before and uh, after. So you can imagine the devastation on the on the side that you, you could see. Uh, but we also uh, noticed some buildings that were 10 to 25 years old on one side of the street, heavy damage or collapse. And then on the other side of the street, the same types of four stories without any collapse. So quite. Uh, Difficult to explain. We we're talking with the people on site, and they were telling us okay, probably it's different construction companies on, but without further deep analysis, it cannot be said. And then the next uh, interesting example, still in Iskenderum, is a five story building that you can see how it looked before and after when uh, it collapsed or so pancake failure. Uh, what we noticed first, important, of course, we know uh, the bedding of uh, smooth tree bars but also a uh, weak column, strong beam uh, connection, and then the joint uh, failure of at the column. Uh, then uh, uh, also next to it, uh, now six-story building uh, that was a reinforced concrete frame plus the shear walls, where we observed a couple of uh, damaged shear walls, and it was usually like from here on, the, on this photo, uh, with the uh, stirrups opening because they were bent at uh, 90 degree uh, hooks. Uh, but uh, this and next example were interesting to be shown because most of the infills that were damaged and collapsed in auto plane had this uh, connection to the arch structure with the foam. So usually they were using this polyurethane foam. And of course, uh, it is easy to use it to fill the gap uh, on the top, especially at contact between the infill and uh, the arch structure. But I think this is a good example to show that this is not acceptable because this phone connection doesn't provide any restraining for the outer plane uh, for the infills, and then they all collapse. And this uh, health, private health center, which was just one year old, uh, of five stories, is the best maybe example for showing this. So you can see the whole facade walls collapsed in outer plane because they were all uh, connected with foam. So here on the photos, we could see at the top uh, of the wall or at the bottom of the slab, there was always foam, which was not a good connection for the infills, and they all uh, tilted and fall in out, fell in outer plane. Then we went more to the south, and here is an example of soft story mechanism in uh, Rainforest concrete frame building uh, that had garage in ground floor. This was uh, uh, this building uh, was damaged or experienced this uh, collapse in this 6.4 magnitude earthquake that was where the epicenter was in this area. And uh, you can see the stirrup spacing that we measured was 20 centimeters, so definitely not adequate. And then potential. Uh, or bad disposition with the uh, soft soil in the ground. 
And here, then went to Antakya, which you know that was the most heavily devastated and damaged uh, part, and just a couple of, let's say, interesting, if we, if we can call it like that, examples. So this is the eight-story building, and we extracted from the Google Maps the photo from 2020, then from 2022, and beside painting and, uh, let's say, refurbishing of the facade, it seems that they added also some walls or some windows in this wall. And uh, this is how this building looks like now. Okay, I'm not saying that it is because of these windows, but we can imagine that probably some additional works were done uh, in this building as well. Definitely, I suppose, some uh, soft story initiated overturning of the building and then it's complete collapse. Of the, yeah. Uh, then we continue with a couple of more examples of overturning, which were mostly seen in Antakya. So this building is eight to ten years old, eight stories again, and uh, we were told on the side that it, it was one of the most expensive buildings in Antakya, so to pay the, the apartment to live in. And it collapsed in this first earthquake of 7.8 magnitude, so you can see it overturned completely to the uh, left. So here is here is shown the rebars at the bottom of the structural elements. And for me, it's interesting, this uh, building here, which also we heard it's new, it's two, three years old without any damage. So good example, uh, even the glass was not uh, cracked or, or damaged. We were not able to inspect, inspect it inside, but I think it's interesting that next to each other, one building overturned and the other one it stayed completely intact. And then behind this building, uh, there is also example of one, uh, let's say, software mechanism and tilting of the building. These are the photos from uh, before. And you can see from the Google Maps, so the building was quite uh, slender. And this is how it looks like today. So I suppose uh, uh, this uh, ground floor, so the first story with a uh, open openings and the shops initiated the soft story in the right part and then the structure built over. And then for me, it was interesting also to show some low rise uh, buildings with the soft stories. So this is a uh, ground floor plus two stories. Uh, we were told that it was heavily damaged in the 7.8, 7.5 uh, earthquake. Definitely this sequence of earthquake devastated it and it could not withstand 6.4 earthquake and uh, it experienced soft story mechanism. So definitely, okay, the disposition was also an issue when the soft story mechanism appeared. And then next to each other, older building, 1972, that had the ground floor and four stories and two stories disappeared due to the soft story effect. Uh, then also interesting example, you can see here two identical, we can call them twin buildings uh, from uh, Antakya. So from before uh, how, how they looked. And um, here is the building behind it was still standing, but these two buildings, as you can see, completely collapsed or painted uh, next to it. Uh, this uh, example here is, uh, let's say usual book example that I want to show like standard uh, shear cracks in the reinforced concrete walls in the ground floor that we uh, documented and there were a lot of several uh, buildings uh, like this having the ground floor and the shear wall x cracks due to the extensive shear forces. Uh, then uh, we proceed to Hotel Sarai uh, that had the ground floor mezzanine in three floors and what we observed uh, a lot, let's say, in, in Turkey is that they have often this mezzanine and uh, uh, sometimes this mezzanine is producing the, let's say, the open ground floor or two heights, uh, uh, two floor heights open, and then this can initiate sometimes a soft story. But here it's interesting example that uh, this uh, beside soft stories here, it's also the structure split or separated in, in two parts which is quite interesting to, to discuss uh, why was this first part built and then this added or some connection was missing. But anyway, we can see here ground floor mezzanine three stories now, just two stories. So several stories missing due to the soft story parts. 
Uh, and then the one thing that I want to point out uh, in Antakya, so this is the photo from Antakya and the Google Maps uh, photo so to show how it was uh, before. And when we walked all around this area, beside the collapse, pancakes, overturning, these all examples that uh, I talked about now, the most dominant type of failure was the infill walls. And uh, they were usually uh, damaged, uh, cracked, and uh, collapsed in outer plane, and usually in the ground floors. And uh, this happens because of the interaction of the in-plane and outer plane effects. So the in-plane effects is damaging the, earth, the, the infills, producing some cracks, and then they cannot withstand the outer plane uh, acceleration and inert inertia forces. But additionally, when the deflection of the crane happens due to the in-plane interstory drift, the contact between the infills and the frame is lost, and then there is no more boundary condition to hold the, uh, the infills to the frame, and they just fell or collapse in outer plane. So therefore, this is an important aspect to think about this connection interaction between the frame and the infill. And here, as you can see, in many examples, always collapse infill walls at the ground or lower, lower stories. Uh, also, we saw all types of uh, bricks used, briquette as they call it in, in Turkey, or concrete blocks, uh, AAC, clay, all of them failed as infills and didn't, didn't work as this interaction of the infills. And uh, for the last slides, uh, uh, one important aspect that uh, I would like to point out, when we enter the homes, you can see how are the seats. And uh, there are ex several examples of buildings remain structurally, but carry damage of infills, partitions, constructive elements, and the people were not trusting these buildings anymore. They said that they, want, they don't want to move back. They said they want building collapsed and new building constructed, although the columns or beams slabs were quite good. And for us, that was, at the, or at least for me, at the beginning surprising, but I could understand it after because you can imagine that if this is your apartment, would you like to live back in this apartment again? Or imagine scene of happening the earthquake and then trying to escape from it, cracks, noise, walls falling around. So definitely there is some trauma to these people that uh, is important aspect to be uh, talked about. And then the last uh, place that we visited was Kipkan. Uh, again, a soft story mechanism because of the open ground floor garage, and then the building tilted and moved to the right. And uh, the last, it's a complex of the building that we visited was quite interesting. The Tunnel 4 buildings in Kirkan, uh, that was a state project from uh, Tokyo. So buildings with a lot of shear walls, really good, uh, let's say, structural behavior. They behaved much better. We also saw other locations, but here I just pointed out some uh, damage that we noticed. Usually they had, let's say, light structural damage, but here I just wanted to point out that beside these buildings are far better than the pure frame buildings, of course. The details had to be taken care and also the disposition. So if you have the shear walls in one direction, we should also have some shear walls in the Particular direction as well. Lab splices, so continuation of the, of the reinforcement is an issue. And uh, also coupling beams were uh, sometimes heavily damaged because of uh, probably quite a big movement for these kind of uh, beams that have uh, quite uh, big shear forces. Uh, and these uh, reinforcement details have to be taken care of. So it's not just that it will be solved everything with this kind of uh, disposition, but definitely some significant improvements will be present. And just to conclude this summary of Frankfurt concrete buildings uh, with, uh, let's say, the most uh, decisive uh, aspects, what we saw or documented was uh, insufficient uh, space stirrups in some cases. Smooth tree bars, we all know the story that they are not uh, good and these are uh, present in, in older buildings. Uh, in some cases when we saw, and that was quite uh, often to see quite good or smaller distance between the syrups, but in insufficient hook de details, so definitely 90 degree hooks, they don't do the work and that's what should be strongly uh, argumented and uh, talked about. 
Overlap uh, lengths, definitely important issue to be taught about as uh, details of the reinforced structures. And the disposition problems such as soft flurry uh, collapses due to the change uh, in stiffness in the upper stories, or openings, ground floors, garages, and so on. Uh, pancake type collapses that I showed you here, mostly due to this uh, weak talent strong beam uh, connection. Uh, joint failures, liquefaction examples that Nemanja showed and talked, and also uh, Lorenzo mentioned it, uh, probably due to the, let's say, in insufficient uh, foundations, probably due to the lack of geotech uh, sufficient geotechnical investigations. Something that we didn't have time to mention uh, here, but I want to mention this as just a, a note, uh, whole type floor slabs or asphalt, as they call them in Turkey, important point to be uh, mentioned and as I said, the most the, the, the most dominant failure type infill walls that uh, do not work, let's say, with the flexible reinforced concrete uh, frame structures. Although the detailing structures are quite uh, well provided in this 2018 uh, Turkish code that uh, Shafat mentioned, but uh, obviously not applied at uh, site. And at the end, to conclude, uh, the most important part beside detailing are the concept and disposition and all the buildings that have good conceptual solution from the very beginning, enough uh, structural elements in the ground floor, good disposition perform well. Although sometimes they were not constructed well, they perform well. But if you have a bad disposition from the very beginning, of course, the, the let's say the result could be as devastating as we are seeing here. Thank you. Okay, now finally, thank you both, uh, Marco and Emanja, for this uh, presentation about the reinforced concrete buildings. Definitely, uh, some of the most affected buildings in the region were of those of that type. And now it is time for us to take a break. We are a little bit late. We will take a 10 minute break anyway, and we will continue back together at 18, 15, 8, 18 30. So it is 10 minutes from now. So 18.30 is when we will start back again with Shafak's presentation on masonry structures. So let us take a short break.
so I think we are back. Um, I was disconnected. Nicola, can you confirm if you can hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, Shafak. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> can you hear me? Too? Coming back. Shafak, can you hear me too? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, thank you. So I will just wait um, a couple of seconds until it's 30, and then uh, I will start. Okay. Okay, so just checking if the controls are working. It takes a couple of seconds, but let, yes, exactly. Okay, so again, hello everyone. Um, in this part, I will be speaking to you about the performance of masonry buildings during the series of the Turkey earthquakes. Before I start, huge thanks to Dr. Zeynep Unsal. Aslan, she is a member of our team. She was a member of our team in Turkey, and we prepared this uh, presentation uh, together. So thank you, Zainab. Let me start. <clears throat> so in Turkey, uh, reinforced concrete and masonry, they represent the most common structural typology. Some statistics to start with. The top figure illustrates the typologies in the Turkish building stock as of 2000 with uh, blue and red representing the frame, so mostly RC, and masonry buildings uh, respectively. Masonry is more present in rural regions of, uh, in, in Eastern Turkey, in regions with lower uh, income. And the figure below displays the structural typology based on the, uh, the, the construction permits issued between 2001 and 15. Uh, it shows the clear uh, re uh, frame or reinforced concrete trend in the entire country. So the response of masonry buildings to seismic excitation is in many ways different than uh, from the RC structures. One primary difference lies in the complexity <clears throat> of interacting in plane and out of plane actions, primarily in the lack of rigid floor diaphragms, as well as the response modification along the building height. <clears throat> Residential masonry in Turkey typically consists of uh, one or two story buildings made of stone masonry with mortar joints or adobe or concrete blocks or also hollow clay bricks. They were not very prevalent in the sites we have visited and were mainly limited to rural areas and confined and reinforced masonry are very rare and we did not see any examples of them. In Islahiye, one of the few non-concrete examples we came across is this adobe building on the left. And you can see uh, the diagonal cracks on the facade wall. We will see a more detailed picture later. And on the right, picture from the inside, picture from the inside, uh, one-way timber slab with a single layer of wood plank and a damage concentration on the outer walls. <laughs> we visited a small village between Osmania and Hatay named Genchobasa. The majority of the residential buildings, including this one, consist of these concrete blocks and concrete slabs. The buildings were generally constructed by the owners without following any engineering regulations. The exterior wall showing uh, diagonal shear stepping cracks starting at the center of the wall, propagating towards the corners with a crack pattern to the mortar. Same wall from the outside indicating the brick pattern with separated wall parts moving away from each other. The global in-plane response was generally limited to buildings with uh, concrete slabs in Genchobasa, Many non-residential buildings were of adobe type, such as this barn. The corner wall is uh, disaggregated due to the inferior quality masonry and also the lack of connection between corner walls. Just allow me one second, excuse me. 
<clears throat> and the roof structure made out of uh, steel sheets is very light and also insufficient to constrain the wall against loads perpendicular, perpendicular to the plane of the wall. So the walls statically seen almost act as a freestanding cantilever walls. Further failure is observed at the barn entrance. This is the picture on the right, close to the large door opening. The mud bricks are placed irregularly and a lack of connection between wall layers intensi intensifies the out-of-plane problem leading to the separation of these layers. Buildings with flexible floor diaphragms, they often show, show the combined in and out of plane behavior. Here on this picture, a mixture of adobe and hollow clay tiles were used on the ground floor and an out of plane uh, failure has occurred in the wall parallel to the floor beams. And due to the lack of floor to wall connections, it was only the self weight of the panel resisting an overturning mechanism, which was obviously not enough to resist the, the destabilizing overturning moments. On the front side of the same building, a vertical hinge has formed in the middle of the adobe wall in a triangular shape, and further vertical cracks indicate an in-plane mechanism underneath the roof structure, which directly rests on top of the facade wall without any horizontal beams. And on this picture, a rigid uh, block motion or rigid body motion is clear. It depicts a clear out of plane rotation of the facade wall where a hinge is formed on top of the ground floor exactly here. The historic city center of uh, Antakya is home to many unreinforced masonry buildings. In our last two days, we spent most of our time in, uh, in and, and uh, around Hatay region in which most of the buildings in old towns were monumental uh, masonry. In a low number of buildings, we observed ring beam-like horizontal elements to stiffen the structure. Here, it's constructed out of the same units as the wall. Their presence is characterized from the horizontal cracks and a clear separation along the wall panel. Generally speaking, we did not encounter any horizontal steel ties between orthogonal walls at floor levels. Here is an example of disintegration of large masonry units uh, out of plane. And on the right, a combined mechanism can be observed. The in-plane actions causing to a diagonal crack in this wall were likely followed by an out-of-plane action in this panel or in this part. The mechanism may have happened gradually following the aftershocks, but uh, the out-of-plane failure could have been prevented with conventional measures focusing on the connection of structural elements. Next example is a hotel building in the old town of Antakya, starting with the picture before the earthquake. A global out of plane mechanism was observed in this building in the facade. The failure is characterized by the overturning of this entire wall, illustrated in uh, red. As evident in the after picture, the collapse was triggered by vertical cracks at the orthogonal wall connections. And that type of failure is a stability failure. It's a rather a stability failure rather than a strength or stress related failure of the material itself. Inside this hotel building, steel beams of the floor system were visible. You can see them here. They are likely stemming from a recent restoration providing or aiming to provide an improved diaphragm action, which, were, which was not sufficient to avoid the out-of-plane failure. Further examples illustrating the wall to, uh, illustrating the floor, uh, the wall floor and wall roof details in most of the cases, wooden floors were poorly connected to exterior and ex uh, interior walls, lacking the desired diaphragm action. The, shear, the, 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 general, the general problem is that the shear stiffness in these types of floor is almost zero, it's almost negligible. And in non-residential buildings, this type of timber floor beams were very uh, common. So if you can look at this picture, since there is no mechanical connection between this element and the wall, there is no mechanical uh, connection between the wall and the slab, meaning that the sole resistance comes from the friction between this beam and the, and the supporting wall. 
And this building in the old town of Antakya has lost its uh, upper story, again, with a picture before and uh, after, and it suffered a roof collapse. This may have been caused by the presence of high vertical components of ground motions, resulting in a drastic reduction in the shear capacity of piers due to uplifting. And on the, on the ground floor, in-plane damage mechanisms can be observed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, here you can see them. And at the time of our visit, the uh, efforts to remove the debris were mainly focused on residential buildings in city centers and many buildings in the old town at this uh, placard stating the heritage status of the building. More examples from Antakya, this Afan building, a stone masonry building built in 1911, high tensile stresses in the upper floors, again, may have initiated the failure in the second story, uh, second story failure mechanism. So in conclusion, let me try to sum up my points. The damage levels we observed, obviously they result from a combination of several factors. The accelerations, they were already high, they reached very high levels and they, they were further amplified due to the soil characteristics, which creates high uh, demands. In uh, some of the cases, the damage was localized on one side of the street, this was already shown <clears throat> by the previous uh, presentation and the previous uh, presentations, and the buildings were standing on the other side despite the similar construction practice. In cultural heritage buildings, out of plane uh, mechanisms, they were the dominating failure type, primarily in presence of timber floor beams spanning in a single direction. Another reason was the inadequate detailing of construction, such as the lack of steel tires favoring a box-like behavior or ring beams, or also sort of anchorage elements constraining the wall, wall connections. The residential low-rise buildings with uh, concrete slabs were, they were capable of developing a global in-plane uh, behavior due to the box-like uh, global uh, response of building. Despite the global damage in these buildings, they performed, at least the ones we have uh, observed, they performed generally well in preventing collapse and reaching life safety performance tar targets. And as uh, the last point, when we are dealing with unreinforced masonry buildings with flexible floor diaphragms, the local behavior usually represents the weakest link. However, the engineering practice often tends to focus on the global uh, behavior during the assessment and also the commercial software. They usually, uh, or they often assume a structural integrity of buildings. So that makes the out of plane an often neglected area in the assessment, in the seismic assessment of existing buildings. And this was proven to be critical, not only in the past events, but also at the, in the series of these uh, Turkey earthquakes. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for listening. And again, huge thanks to Dr. Zeynep Günsal Asna. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shafak. Now we'll move on to the next presentation. So I would like to welcome you to my presentation. Uh, so my name is uh, Christoph Gutenweg. Uh, so I'm working for more than 20 years on industrial facilities. I'm a member of the uh, Center for Wind and Earthquake Engineering at Aachen University, and um, I'm also uh, quite active uh, with my company uh, working on this uh, uh, topic on industrial facilities. And uh, so my focus is, uh, let's say, the performance of uh, industrial buildings uh, during the uh, Turkey earthquake uh, series. And uh, so I think um, we saw some uh, really good, uh, let's say, examples and lessons, uh, which can also be used uh, as a basis uh, for the uh, codes that are going to develop uh, for the second generation of the Euro codes. Um, so first of all, just a moment, no, it's not moving. It, it takes a couple of seconds. Okay. <clears throat> you can keep trying. Yeah, I will try it. Now it's moving, huh? Okay. 
So um, I, I will show the damage uh, to a typical uh, silo constructions. So we have here the aerial view uh, on this uh, side, uh, and we can see um, ground supported silos uh, on top. And uh, lower down, we see uh, also some um, elevated silos, uh, in total 16 silos. And we can also see the situation after the earthquake. So uh, mostly all of the elevated silos are completely collapsed. And one silo of the ground supported silo was, uh, group was uh, collapsed. Um, and uh, this shows also the vulnerability of uh, the uh, elevated silos. And um, this can be easily explained by uh, the example of the only silo that uh, survived. So we can see it on the left. And uh, we can see uh, the substructure and uh, the silo on top. And um, what is going on is we have a really, let's say, huge labyrinth. We have a huge mass on top. And on one hand, we have a, let's say, compression, which is acting on the silo shell in horizontal direction. And uh, this horizontal excitation uh, will produce actions acting on the columns and on the silo hopper as well. And an important aspect is also the vertical component um, of the earthquake, which is uh, sometimes neglected in the design. But we will see that it is quite important to consider this uh, vertical component, especially uh, for silo constructions, because uh, the vertical component on the silo hopper will also produce, uh, let's say, compression forces um, in circumferential direction. So, what was happening, uh, we can see it here, um, the failure to anchorage. So due to the fact that we have really high tension forces, so we can see that uh, we have uh, some tension failure. So with the pull out behavior of uh, the anchorages, but also bending failure of the footing plates and shear failure, pure shear failure of uh, the bolts and the combination of uh, tension and shear failure of the bolts for some of the footings. So uh, lower down, you see uh, the situation uh, for one of the uh, collapsed uh, silo construction. And you can easily see that it's completely uh, instabilized and it was completely collapsed and the substructure was not able to withstand any more the earthquake action uh, because of the weak anchorages. But we can also see that uh, the substructure itself suffers a lot of uh, damage. So for example, you can see here quite easy, uh, some uh, of the frames, uh, they do not have any more any diagonals. So that means the stiffening system uh, collapsed. And if we have a closer look on the frames, we can also see that the bolts are missing. So what is the reason for that? So on one hand, uh, it is probably a combination of uh, the damage uh, to, the, uh, to the support and the connections. Um, but there is also, um, let's say, the possibility that it happens in this way that we have this vertical component, we have a, a compression uh, component uh, in circumferential direction. And what we saw uh, on side is also buckling of the ring beam uh, accompanied with uh, the failure of the bolts um, connecting uh, the frames uh, to each other. So it is really a mixture of different uh, mechanisms uh, that uh, occur during uh, the earthquake. Um, an important aspect uh, is shown here. Um, so this is uh, one of the, or this is the only uh, remaining construction. And uh, what you can clearly see here is uh, there is a heavy buckling uh, in the silo hopper uh, due to the different uh, earthquake directions. And uh, this is a combination also with uh, some damage which occur in the frame structure in circumferential direction. So it's really 
an interplay and um, it's it's like uh, let's say lessons learned uh, what we know what we have to consider in the design so uh, what i saw in the past that uh, this effect was not considered all the time by the by the designers but uh, we have to incorporate it definitely in the codes and uh, we have to be careful with the different components acting on on side of constructions what we can see here is another example um, it is a complete overturning because of a stability failure of the columns as i showed before we have always a combination and uh, stability problem is also uh, quite decisive uh, because we have a high increase of uh, the compression force due to the high vertical load level um, due to the silo filling. If we are talking about uh, ground supported silos, um, we saw that they are vulnerable, of course, but uh, in comparison to the elevated silos, um, the damage was, I would like to say, more controlled. So it was necessary to deconstruct them, no, no doubt about it, but they were not completely collapsed, not all of them. So what we saw uh, was that uh, they uh, suffered uh, damage uh, because of buckling um, of the shell and the stiffness as well. So what is the reason for that? On the right, you see the pressure distribution, which is a combination of uh, the static uh, pressure uh, due to the uh, wheat that was uh, inside uh, the silos here and the hydrodynamic pressure which is acting on the wall and then you have an unsymmetric pressure distribution which can cause this type of damage and this unsymmetric pressure distribution is also responsible for the failure of uh, the supporting and uh, of the anchorages. So here you see the, the sheer failure of some bolts. So they are not connected anymore. And what we also can see on the left is that we have a kind of buckling at the base, which is caused by the high overturning moment, which comes from this unsymmetric load case uh, due to the acceleration of uh, the content of the silo. Furthermore, uh, so we have also to distinguish between uh, slender and uh, squat silos. So what we saw here um, in Turkey is that for slender silos, the situation is even worse. So here you can see a complete overturning because of the failure of the anchorages. So I, can, I think we can imagine that uh, the lever arm uh, between the, uh, the different, um, let's say, anchorages is, is quite small. So the, uh, the tension forces are quite high and uh, they were not able to withstand these uh, uh, seismic action in this case. And uh, so it's a complete uh, collapse. And uh, this is a bit different to the squat silos, which are ground supported. So here we can clearly see that we have also a kind of buckling, sometimes a combination of uh, normal forces and, and shear forces but not this uh, drastic overturning. And really important aspect uh, are the, let's say the interaction of uh, ancillary elements and uh, the, the structure itself. So we saw a lot of interactions. So I'm, I cannot show you all the interactions that we obtained, but uh, so what was quite interesting and it was already mentioned several times in the presentations before. Um, so the, the interaction, for example, between infills that were um, completely damaged or collapsed uh, due to the out of plane failure. So that was also the case in the facilities. So that means the out of plane failure um, occurred, then the infill was falling down and it was falling on pipes, on, on, on the other ancillary elements. And these are catastrophic consequences. And uh, I think we have to learn that uh, we have to secure the um, separation walls within industrial buildings by diagonals, or we have to use, let's say, a different kind of uh, separation walls uh, because it is too dangerous. 
So what you can see uh, on the left is uh, there was a rupture of uh, the pipeline, of the connecting pipeline to a tank. So this is uh, also quite usual because the tank is not moving. The pipeline is uh, more or less moving with ground motion. And there are some uh, differences or uh, differential displacements. So this is one aspect. The other aspect, what you see on the top is uh, what I already mentioned. So this, uh, let's say, interaction between infields and technical components. Sometimes uh, you can also uh, see that uh, there is uh, a problem with the pipes, uh, which are supported by, by racks. So the, the pipes are moving from the racks because of uh, insufficient uh, supporting lengths. And if we check, let's say, inside uh, the facilities, uh, there are also some uh, damage uh, to uh, vessels and tanks and especially to the supporting points of, of these installations. So what was uh, quite uh, interesting, um, you can see here, we have a, a kind of a silo on top. Um, on a, I think it was a first story, uh, on top of a first story. And uh, it is quite clear that uh, the, the acceleration was amplified and uh, we obtained a high overturning moment, which caused the buckling of uh, one of the columns. And as a consequence, we see here that uh, the system totally collapsed. And uh, this is also something that uh, we have to consider in the design. So we have to, to take the floor response spectra, which can be highly amplified, uh, depending on the uh, frequency range that we are talking about. So my, my last slide shows some uh, typical damage um, uh, to uh, vessels um, inside uh, an oil um, facility. Um, so on the left, we can see some um, buckling um, on, the, on the shell. Uh, it is a combination of uh, buckling due to, uh, um, <clears throat> due to axial stresses and uh, shear stresses. And then uh, on the right, uh, we can see these uh, typical effects uh, of um, buckling um, close to the supports um, and to the anchorages. So this is quite typical. And there is always a danger that, uh, for example, the weldings are completely uh, damaged and collapsed so that uh, the, the fluid can uh, spread outside. And this is something that we uh, should avoid uh, because uh, sometimes the content is, is toxic or whatever. So we, we see again that uh, these are, let's say, the decisive points uh, that we have to uh, take into account in our design. So this was a short overview uh, about the industrial uh, facilities and the, import, uh, and the performance of uh, these buildings in Turkey. And um, yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, so I will be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Buderik. Uh, so now we have another presentation that Nico is going to do. Yes. So hello, everyone. My name is Nikola Blagojevic. Uh, can you hear me? OK, great. Yes. Uh, so I'll go, I'm going to talk briefly about what we observed regarding infrastructure and recovery efforts. And uh, yeah, I just so as you saw from uh, speakers before me, the focus of our mission was on buildings, masonry, RC, and industrial facilities. But we also managed to observe observe the state of a couple of bridges, some water towers, also to see the access to utilities of of, of people in the affected areas, the re current recovery activities, some functional recovery observations, and then finally I'll close with some tools that we're developing to support re recovery planning. And uh, for each of the structures, you're going to see some PGA estimates, and these are derived from the Shake Map SIM uh, software developed by Lukas Bodeman and Professor Sadinovic. You can, it's free, you can, you can find it on GitHub, and you can also use it. You just input the coordinates of the location, and you get your PGA estimates together with the uncertainty bounds. And so let's start with the highway overpasses. <clears throat> so when we were traveling around this area, we noticed that almost all bridges were functional. 
And when we talk about highway overpasses, they're usually reinforced concrete in their prefabricated girders. And here is an example of a damaged prefabricated bridge overpass between Gaziantep and Nurda, where what we saw was that the bearings were displaced by around 20 centimeters in this direction. And this also caused some, this pounding caused some damage to the abutment. And you can also see the settlement of the abutment compared to the, the, the neighboring soil compared to the abutment by, by about 20 centimeters. And we saw a couple of uh, overpasses that, that had this kind of damage. But despite this, they were still being used by, we saw vehicles crossing, crossing this overpass. I just wanted to mention there, what we didn't see so often were steel bridges. And there was one on the highway between Osmani and Nurda. It has some kind of dampers. You can see the PGA of 0.3 G and there was no damage. So bearings were in place, even pipes didn't break. Everything was uh, fine. And now talking about bridges within the cities, uh, this is downtown Antakya, which was heavily damaged, as you saw from the pictures by Marko Nemanja and Shafak. And you can see the bridge in, in, in the center of Antakya. No, most of the damage is concentrated at the ends of, of, the, of the bridge, but it's still being used. And we also crossed it. And you can also see vehicles on this bridge. Another example of a bridge in a city in, in Antakya is near this uh, concrete bridge. There is a pedestrian steel bridge. You can see the before and the after photos, quite high PGA. And what we could see is that, th that this is mostly non-structural damage. We couldn't really access uh, the bridge because it was closed for use. But what we see is that these panels fell out and uh, this was the main, the main damage. Uh, also, we were able to see some water towers, uh, we, we, which we noticed from the highway. So we just approached and want to see how they look like. This is a water tower in, um, uh, in, in Antakya. Once again, quite high PGA. And what we saw are, uh, is, is damage at the column base, as you can see here, and also at the joints between these ring beams and columns. It's mostly concrete spalling, and this concrete spalling revealed the rebars, which are uh, smooth where we have smooth stirrups and what you're talking about bars that are ribbed and here we have stirrups at 30 centimeters at the base which is quite a lot and uh, we also see that a lot of these uh, rebars are corroded and so another example of a water tower is near Arsus and here we did find a, a, a local which uh, gave us a couple of more information about this water tower this is a 25 year years old water tower, which was painted just before the earthquake. So all the damage that you see here, this is all from the earthquake. And it has a 50 ton capacity and was full during the earthquake. So there was a lot of mass that was moving. Um, and you can see this led to concrete spalling, um, damage at the column base, once again, revealing the, the corroded uh, bars. And it was out of service after the earthquake because the pipes were broken. And this was repaired fairly quickly, so they continued using this water tower that supplies around 200 families, despite this damage that, that, that still exists. Uh, also, while we were walking through the cities, we were focusing on the substations. We tried to understand if there's any damage in the substations, and from what we saw, they were mostly fine. But the, the ERI team did notice some damage uh, on the substations, and you can read more about this in their report, which is quite good and very detailed. And also from the report, uh, we found out that there were some coal power plants which experienced damage and, and were offline <clears throat> due to the earthquake, but also that the hydropower plants, so the dams, <clears throat> performed quite well. And another thing that should be noted here is there is a big change in the, the demand for electric power because there is so much damage, damage to residential buildings and we have people leaving these areas. They don't demand as much power as they needed before the earthquake. And so the system is also not that strained. And so as we are recovering the power system, it should also be important to take into account the, the increase in demand that's going to come once these buildings are going to be repaired and once people are going to come back and start co consuming power. And so now moving on to functional recovery and infrastructure. So when we talk about functional recovery, we're basically thinking about a post-earthquake state where a building is sort of damaged. It's not that it's pre-earthquake condition, but it can, it can still be used. And what we try to figure out is what are the conditions for a building to be in a functional recovery state. And when we were in Iskenderun, we got to talk to some locals. So we did like unstructured interviews. And what we found out was that in these kinds of neighborhoods where you have collapsed buildings, 
next to these buildings with minor damage, the municipality usually uh, shuts down the access to utilities to the whole neighborhood. So even if your building is built properly and uh, there is not a lot of damage, most likely you won't have access to electricity, gas, or water because the, the neighboring building is a safety concern. It, they don't want any risk. And so then we also went to other neighborhoods where there was not a lot of damage. And here we also asked people, and here we heard that there is power, there is water, there is gas, everything is working, they live in their buildings. So this is an important um, note regarding the functional recovery. It's not only about your building, it's not only how you design your building, it's also about the neighboring buildings. <clears throat> and now talking about functional recovery and damage. So this is also Iskenderun, and here you can see a bakery which was working, as you can see there are people outside, despite these in infill damage, which you can see here. So this is something that this bakery didn't mind, they could operate. And here is also an interesting example where on the left, you, you see very, two very similar buildings. They're both RC. And on the left, this one was operational. So this cafe was open here, people were inside. But then on the right, there is a bakery here, which was abandoned. And one of the reasons is most likely the difference in the damage. So here you can see that the damage is visible uh, from the exterior, and here there is no damage. <clears throat> and so about uh, about um, more widespread uh, recovery efforts, what we were seeing constantly when we were there in March, this was a month and a half after the earthquake, we were seeing uh, demolition and debris removal. This was the dominant recovery activity. And we also find out found out that, for example, to demolish such a building, it takes only four hours, even less, it depends on the, the, the amount of damage that there is to this building. And we also talk with the locals to try, to try to try to understand what's their perspective for the future. And most of the time we got the answer that they're waiting for instructions from the government. So everybody was still confused, confused they were waiting for a reconstruction strategy. But we also, especially in, in Turkoglu, I think we found an owner of a building which took the, took the initiative and he organized a demolition debris removal by himself on, on his own, on, on cost, and cost and he plans to rebuild his building as soon as possible. And what my impression was when we were talking with people there is that this uncertainty regarding the future recovery plans is not helping because it's it's increasing the likelihood of them moving out and moving their lives to different places. And then even if you reconstruct these cities, there's going to be a big question of who's going to come back if this takes a long time. Uh, we were also, when we were in Turkoglu, uh, we we saw a building material depot where people were packing up some uh, uh, rebar. And so we wanted to know who is buying rebar right now, a month and a half after the earthquake, who's going to build. And uh, what we uh, heard was that it was mostly people in villages and small places, which are already collecting the material to start repairing and rebuilding their homes. We also uh, heard that the prices have increased by around 15% if we were talking about the rebar cost. And uh, one, another important thing to note is that future large-scale reconstruction efforts are going to strain the local um, availability of building materials and workforce and machines. So it remains to be seen if, if the, the, the region is going to be able to provide enough material for all the reconstruction efforts or if the, the whole country will have to step in and, and help out with that. And we also went to a couple of villages, as uh, Shafak pointed out, and we also talked with people there. And uh, there, what was quite impressive was that these buildings were examined two days after the earthquake. So this is a village close to Nurda. So this was quite fast after the earthquake, considering the amount of damage. And but people are now in tents and they're waiting for further instructions. And so what they were telling us is that they heard that, OK, if a building is very damaged, it's going to be demolished. but most of the buildings that have slight damage are going to be retrofitted. And these buildings, they, they often um, build them by themselves, and they really don't understand how they can retrofit and strengthen these buildings. So even if the state provides some financial means for this, it's not clear how they would uh, consume these resources, this money that the government would give them. So some instructions for retrofitting would also uh, come quite in handy. And talking a bit about uh, the industrial facilities and their recovery. So Professor Butenberg already mentioned this silo. And now I'll say a bit about the recovery efforts. So what we were able to, to find out from the people on this site is that they're current, they were creating bids for contractors in March. Uh, so a month and a half after the earthquake. And they want to rebuild as quickly as possible because these silos are important for the local economy. They house animal food. And there is quite a bit of... Um, 
uh, farming around. And uh, what they also told us is that they, now they won't use steel anymore. They want to use uh, reinforced concrete and they want to use wider and lower uh, RC silos. So this might be a better solution. It, it remains to be seen. And so finally, to conclude, um, what, I, what I would like to say is that we are in the research community developing digital tools which can help us create and define efficient recovery plans. So in the same way in which we use software to design buildings, we can use software to design reconstruction strategies. And then while we're developing these strategies, we're also, we also have to go to a certain um, data collection and a certain number of steps, which are uh, on, on their own already defining the reconstruction strategy. And for to, to actually implement this in practice, we do need to engage with local engineers, researchers, and, and, and authorities. And uh, now is the time to do this, because if, if we can have good recovery planning and if we can have these kinds of tools which allow us to do what-if analysis and understand how different decisions made now are going to affect the, uh, the recovery in the years to come, we might be able to, to make better decisions. And also, this would be interesting for the research community because then we get to improve these models. And also, now we hear that a lot of teams are going back to, to Turkey. And this is quite good for us because this allows us to, to, to do longitudinal studies where we can collect the data in a structured way and we can go back to the same sites and see how their recovery is progressing. And this would allow us to identify main factors which hinder recovery so in the future we can avoid um, such issues. And so I would stop here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer. And I think we, we can also open the Q&A session now. Uh, so thank you for, for listening. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for to, <clears throat> to the presenters. And let us take a look at some of the questions. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Kishore Jaswal asking about, well, thanking Marco specifically for the presentations. And yes, all the presentations were excellent. And I hope we learned quite a few details. Even though we have already watched quite a few presentations, there were some very unique things that, that this team has found out. And uh, Kishore's question has to do with uh, uh, aggregate performance uh, concerning some percentages of typical damage state occurrences in, in buildings. Uh, is there some uh, idea that we can get uh, from looking at a relatively small number of buildings, just what your impression is as to what dominated and what didn't dominate? If you can answer, Marco, that would be great. Uh, thank you for the comment and uh, the question. So I think uh, regarding do we have some data or uh, let's say uh, evaluated data results about the uh, performance, aggregate performance, typical damage states. We don't. I think uh, Nicola was more working on this uh, communication with the local authorities and uh, uh, collection of uh, damage states and damage assessment. Also, Shabif was working on it. But so maybe they can answer it. So we, as from our side, our small team, are working on it. But I think there is some data more uh, on the global uh, perspective from Turkey that Nicola can say. Uh, yes, thanks, Marco. So exactly, uh, uh, if if you want to get in contact with me, I'm happy to share. There there are a couple of websites where you can see the, the results of the damage assessment in, let's say, a GIS kind of a format. So this allows, I guess, your question is related to fragility curves and similar analysis so it will be quite useful to do these kinds of analysis and th yes there is some kind of uh, ge geographically distributed damage state uh, data on the buildings which we can then aggregate correlate with pga or spectral acceleration and do some kind of risk analysis okay and uh, uh, there was another question from uh, markel baba leku he uh, or she's asking about uh, damage to already inspected buildings. Did we see, did we possibly, yeah, sorry, they did retrofit it, sorry, not inspected. Um, uh, did we inspect any retrofitted buildings? Uh, no, so as far as I know, we didn't uh, have it. Uh, I, we planned it because uh, we had the uh, information from uh, ERI or from Professor Ifanogo from Eichel. I think he's also here. They inspected, so here I inspected some uh, FRP strengthened uh, buildings, and that was uh, mentioned in some previous presentations from 
ERI, and I think also if it visited in, I think it was in Antakya, uh, three buildings from which two were uh, strengthened with FRP and the one that was not strengthened collapsed. The other one performed better, had some, some damage, but did not collapse and survive. But it's better to watch uh, the presentation from ERI and IFI because they, they inspected uh, these buildings that were metrified with FRP. We did it. Yeah, okay. So, so, <clears throat> so yeah, <laughs> this is so far as I can see everything that we have in the question and answer oh, window yeah. right now. We have more. Uh, oh, okay. Ah, now question. they're coming in. Now they're coming in from Sasha. Yeah. yeah, Marco, do you want to take that? Uh, okay, so should I read it? <laughs> it's a uh, Sasha Popovic, oh, a long question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there are two, two questions really. Uh, uh, let me just take a look at um, uh, the first one uh, is about the, the, the poor, well, possibly not the best possible building due to a variety of issues that affect construction. Um, uh, the, this is a very common question when it comes to Turkey. Did we see any influence uh, of, well, cutting corners in some way or the other? Did we see evidence of that? Or did you? Is there there's a little bit more uh, to be well given to um, perhaps not being very well informed about all the newest uh, Turkish code provisions, or not being able to implement them because of some traditional practices that keep being used over and over again. So this was this is the first one. But I guess for everybody, I mean, perhaps Shafa or Marco or Sherifet, since you. Um, May, may want to comment on what happens between the design and the actual delivery of the building. Um, I mean, the I can try to address one thing. I mean, I have to say I never worked in Turkey. I mean, I had some internship, but I don't think that would count. So, I mean, the, the one question was missing reinforcement buildings built by certain cons contractors consistently behaving poorly. I mean that I can only I mean based on some media exam I mean some some uh, some news appeared in the media that yes certain contractors and that uh, their buildings we had poorly mostly uh, collapsed uh, just give me one second sorry it's too loud so that yes based on uh, media appearance yes but it's difficult to it's difficult to conclude. Um, because I never worked in Turkey I and mean, I can't, I can't really tell, but yes, I mean, this is something people were to, uh, talking about, you know, about the implementation. I mean, uh, for the code part, I think the Tur Turkish code is really strict. I mean, it's, it has hundreds of pages. It's really up to date. It even considers base size certain building high rise, but about the execution or about the enforcement, I cannot really tell. So perhaps we have also as uh, some people, some professionals from Turkey, if they would like to say something, or not, Sheriff Marco, perhaps you can say something. <clears throat> I mean, I can say, I think Sheriff, we can say maybe more, but that, what I can say is more or less repetition of what we try to show through the slides. So we could see the, for example, when we talk about the reinforcing details and uh, some uh, construction elements. We could see that uh, obviously in some elements where, where you would expect that the code gives an engineering judgment gives let's say less spacing in the stirrups and critical zones or as I said the hooks with 90 degrees it's prescribed that it, they should be 135 or overlapping to the one uh, side uh, that was not present uh, but what I believe more is the problem besides this uh, potential corruption, which I think in some cases it was ev evident that it was uh, present, but we didn't do any detailed study that we could back up this, uh, uh, let's say, statement. Um, I think it's more important, this is what I tried to state at the end of my conclusions are, let's say, good choice of disposition and conceptual solution for the structure. Uh, from the architectural point of view and good preparation with investors for them to understand that uh, some structural elements are needed to be designed in that, uh, let's say, size, quality, and constructed in, in, uh, according to the prescribed rules. And I think if this is followed 
we saw it. So we saw a couple of times, as you said, some buildings that were not, let's say, they had some minor, uh, let's call it flaws, but they didn't collapse something. They didn't even have a, a, a minor damage, so just light damage. So it means that it can be done. And uh, just if uh, all the steps from the beginning until the end, so from design, control of the design uh, projects, construction, control of construction, quantity surveyor, so on, is done correctly and the state does its own job, then I think uh, the result will, will be good or better. So that's what we could do to, to get give any detailed statement without a detailed study. It's not possible. Okay. So again, Michael summed up very well. I don't have anything to add. Yeah, admittedly, this is a tough question that comes very often whenever we have uh, such dramatic behavior of buildings in such a large scale, but we should not forget that this was a very, very, very large earthquake. Like Lorenzo said in the beginning, the affected area is the size of the entire country of Germany or so, and the fault is, as, I mean, 400 something kilometers long. It's quite huge. So even good buildings, had, had a tough time, but uh, uh, fortunately there were some which we managed to find. Uh, let me uh, let me move on uh, to Svetlana's question. And uh, Svetlana is of course asking about the building code and which version of the building code is most relevant for the reinforced concrete buildings. I guess I will broaden it to the old buildings uh, that we visited. Uh, basically, how many buildings were doing Yes, were built to the newer code. How many were built to then the older codes? And uh, this this may include some transition period. Are are you guys aware of anything like that? Perhaps um, there was, there was yeah. one. Oh, sorry, uh, from the statistics uh, from, from Twig, the Turkish Authority or Statistics. Uh, there, I mean, they had this study for the for this 10, 11 cities hit by the earthquake in these regions. Um, that others can correct me if I'm not, but from what I remember, the, the buildings uh, in these regions, roughly 40 to 50, 55% of them were built in the last uh, 20 years or after 2000. And 2000 is, this is also um, something you would hear. When it go through the, the older codes, people usually differ, uh, uh, differentiate between buildings that are that were built before 2000 and after 2000 because of the 99 uh, Izmit earthquake. So after then, the codes were uh, uh, tightened a lot. So I think that is the, the the year to take. So when you would consider uh, the P or the um, or uh, P modern buildings, so to say, if you can say in the last 20 years. And in these regions, roughly 50% of the buildings were built uh, after 2000, so in the last uh, last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so quite, quite a large percentage of new buildings, yeah. I guess. Uh, there was also a comment I heard before in some other presentations is that this was a very fast developing part of Turkey for many reasons, but um, uh, the, the a lot of development has taken place in the last 20, 30 years. Um, uh, so, so it's a little sad that uh, it didn't work. I mean, many of the buildings didn't work out so well, but I'm hoping that we're also going to get some percentages uh, after, after uh, quite a few um, studies are done and summarized in the, in the upcoming special issues of several journals. I think our group, we decided to go for the special issue in the earthquake spectra. I hope that's still the case. So <clears throat> I, I, I'm uh, reasonably certain that you that we're gonna make it and that uh, everybody in this call is going to uh, then have some more documentation from us regarding, regarding the trip that we saw. Uh, any other questions that, that may be out there with, with the audience? Uh, yes, actually, there is one which I'm trying to type the answer to now, but it might, might be easier for me to answer. So, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, I see. Marino Pena, uh, the question is uh, regarding the examples of functional and non functional buildings. Did we find out if the functional state was determined by the engineers, by the engineering professionals, or was it just assumed by the people? And were the people still afraid of possible aftershocks? So, as, as Sharifa mentioned in her part of the presentation, 
uh, engineers did inspect buildings and so I think it, it was also determined if the building is safe to occupy or if it, it, it should be abandoned. So if it was safe to occupy, then people uh, could use it, as you saw in the examples which, which we showed. And um, regarding the, but it doesn't have to mean that they did use it. Sometimes people would move away or they would just be too afraid to live in, inside there, especially because of aftershocks, like you mentioned. And now that I was thinking about this question, the example from the village is really came back uh, to my mind because there almost everybody was intense even if their buildings had only minor or non-structural damage uh, because they exactly because they were afraid of aftershocks and they were waiting for the building to be repaired or demolished and rebuilt mm -hmm. yeah no, it is it is a tough one uh, uh i i I'm looking at the Q Q and A, and I guess after Svetlana, and I'm sorry, one I didn't, I scroll down too fast for me. Um, so um, I, <clears throat> uh, the one question that I keep asking, and uh, uh, is one of well, basically, are we going to go back? Uh, what is going to happen sometime in September, October this year, or about the six month anniversary? or what will happen a year from now from the earthquake in February. Um, shall we go back? What would make sense? Um, is there, is there uh, some way that we could benefit from such a visit that is relatively far apart? Uh, or should we go back more often? Um, what do you guys think? Well, considering I, I was talking about recovery, Yes, I think it would definitely be, be good to, to go back. I'm not sure how often. It also depends on how quickly recovery pro progresses. And there are also other teams going. As you know, Svetlana Brzev is going there in June. So it, it would be also good if we could all coordinate together and then have some kind of a structured way of collecting the data and trying to understand how these cities are going through these recovery phases. Yeah, for me, and perhaps uh, more directly to Professor Wutenek, uh, after New Zealand, there was a noticeable change in the style of construction. They went for this low damage construction. And the, what was mentioned about the silos, the change of the style of the silos, uh, would that be something that we could observe even without going there through some uh, projects that come by on, in, in uh, well, design offices? Maybe maybe we could do that. Uh, I don't know if you heard me, uh, uh, Christoph. Perhaps on the change of the style of the silo designs. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking about it. So <clears throat> I I think the the problem with silos it, it's it's not only the style of the silos. Uh, so I think it's also the the design approach and um, silos are quite complex. Um, so I had a lot of problems in practice. So if, if you think about, for example, these batteries that, that we saw, they have different filling states. Um, so we do not have uh, a really clear eigenfrequencies. Uh, eigenfrequency is changing in dependency on the filling state. So I, I think it's a mixture. So on one hand, we still have some design problems from my point of view, because it's not so, so easy, let's say, to define clear boundary conditions. So that or the loading conditions, that, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, and this is also something that, that we saw um, um, in, the, in, the, in the typical damage uh, photos here, uh, is that uh, there are some weak points which are still not, let's say, really good implemented in the code. So I think we, we can learn something from, from this earthquake and um, we can improve details of the silo constructions and uh, we have to be careful in, in changing the silo constructions uh, too much with respect to earthquake safety. Yeah, yeah I, 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 would, <clears throat> I would agree with that. Some very fast decisions May may bring about another disaster, if not perhaps to distant future. Um, 
not to say that the New Zealanders have, are doing a bad job, but there is, as you know, from literature, quite a lot of uh, papers on this low damage design on use of rocking or other or damping and other replaceable hinges, for example, there. But there was one more question for, uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Idris Bedrinaoglu uh, on what about the light, what did we see about light damaged buildings? There are those that were tilted and they're definitely going to go uh, be demolished, but there are those buildings that are fairly lightly damaged. Uh, are they going to be repaired? Uh, how uh, during that repair, perhaps do you know, are they going to also uh, be retrofitted or a little changed, centered, not only repaired to the previous state? Could anybody comment on that? Cedric, maybe you have some information from site. Uh... Yeah, I think I she's think... new to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. yeah, I think we should, but I'm not the ex I don't have like quite expertise in this area. I just uh, volunteer. I was volunteer in the weight assessment, but from my point of view, I think we can. But the another problem is the psych uh, psychological problem. Do they want to look at the same place? And from the economic point. We should, I think, uh, after uh, making additional tests about uh, uh, earth earthquake resistance, but uh, on the other hand, there is a psychological part that people don't want to use the same place. Uh, so we should balance this and we should decide according to these uh, components, I think. Yeah, okay. I mean, <clears throat> there is always an opportunity to build back better, as they would say, in, in many ways. Uh, um, but <clears throat> in individual buildings, individual owners, uh, fi financing and all that gets in the way. I would hope that more uh, infrastructure level, um, systemic level buildings, such as hospitals, such as schools, such as um, industrial facilities, facilities of the utilities, that there will be an opportunity not only to repair, but to build back better in many ways. Um, uh, let me just check one more time if there are any more questions. I don't see any. Do you, Nicola or Marco, or do you see any questions? No, I think uh, it's fine. Uh, no, there is one. I agree with the last uh, comment yes, that the performance of all the buildings should be checked for sure. I agree with this comment. Yeah. I think uh, since we are 7.30, so more or less the end is uh, planned according to the agenda, maybe Bonjour can close it. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And so with, with that said, uh, I would like, first of all, to thank all of the speakers uh, that, that took part in this, starting with uh, Lorenzo, um, and then uh, followed by Sherife, but then Shafak, then Nemanja and Marco together on reinforced concrete buildings before the break. And later, after the break, the masonry, uh, Shafak on masonry, Professor Wutenweg on uh, industrial facilities, Nicole on recovery. And I think we had a short but a fruitful discussion session. This webinar will be taped. It will be posted, I think, on Susie's website relatively soon. And everybody who, who, who uh, signed up will get an email about that. And to, to close, in addition to thanking uh, all of the uh, uh, presenters to thanking the sponsors that, that uh, uh, and the helpers who made our mission possible. I would like to thank the audience who reached something like 80 people at one point. Thank you all very much for attending and uh, listening to our, to our uh, um, information that we gathered. I hope it was useful. With that, I, I, I will sign off and uh, we will close the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.